Chapter 1. Intro. Can you imagine being a founding member of a band on a massively influential independent label like SPV, only to have everyone ostracize and quit on you because you stormed the Capitol with intentions to commit felonious assault and battery and possibly murder politicians? This is the situation John Schaefer finds himself in, a laughingstock among many communities. I've been following the ongoing federal case against John Schaefer since finding out he was involved in the failed January 6th takeover. It keeps getting more and more convoluted and interesting as the case, pre-trial, and trial situations unfold. For those that don't know, John Schaefer is not only the guitar player and founding member of successful bands Iced Earth and Demons and Wizards, but he is, or rather was, also a founding and lifetime member of the militia group founded by Stuart Rhodes, the Oath Keepers. The same Oath Keepers that helped breach and storm the Capitol on January 6th in 2021. There have been ample amounts of pictures, videos, and even presentations by the January 6th committee, all linking members of this fascist organization to using two quote-unquote columns of organized wannabe paramilitary-esque goons breaching into the Capitol with ill intent towards their elected officials. Before we dive in, I want to say that this video is assuming you know who the Oath Keepers are and what happened on January 6th why it all happened, and who the other people I name are. If it's too confusing without me giving more context, please feel free to reach out and share your opinion. To cut down on the script and overall length of the video, we are omitting these things as much better videos have been made on the subjects than what I could provide. Lastly, I want to note that I'm not going to try and explain why he stormed the Capitol, only that he did and what led up to it. Trying to explain would require a psych degree, and I'm just not that smart. Being a lifetime and founding member of the alt-right, Oath Keepers terrorist organization is not what John thought it would be. He thought he was founding a close fraternal organization with upper middle class people that shared his same hardline views. Instead, what he got was kicked out and disavowed from his own local Indiana chapter, and I'm sure disavowed by the Florida group as well because they view him as a weak, cowardly snitch to their brand. They took his money and kicked him out. As easy as it is now to spot his behavior as outwardly fascist, it is in hindsight we have to view it now, and it's not exactly new behavior. You can see here that John Schaefer was wearing Confederate flag paraphernalia on stage, in music videos, and in photo shoots long before he was an open fascist. Well, I wouldn't say the Confederate flag makes him a fascist, but that's a discussion for another time. His band Sons of Liberty, named after the secret society formed by U.S. colonizers to rebel against the British crown and its taxes, released an album where Schaefer could openly express his libertarian views. Not only are the lyrics a big red flag, but so is all the artwork associated with the album. Song titles like Don't Tread on Me, False Flag, and We the People showcase the mindset he's been in since the mid-2000s. So it's not like this turn into a January 6th insurrectionist is remotely surprising. We just weren't paying enough attention until it was too late. Chapter 2. Shaper's Identity in Metal and His Contributions John's first big metal act is Iced Earth. While I cannot say I have any idea whether the band will continue or not with three of the other four members having publicly quit, one can safely say they're not touring any time in the foreseeable future. Iced Earth have long been lauded for their songwriting abilities, and by some for the lyrical and conceptual content the band brings as well. I'm confident in saying that being interested in the U.S. Civil War, World War II, and ancient generals does not raise the red flag. Speaking of flags, he loves to wear the Confederate battle flag on his bandanas on stage and photo shoots, as well as rock a Gadsden flag guitar. Both of these are huge red flags, and I don't know how they weren't picked up on earlier. Then again, his following probably loved it, so maybe I'm not so surprised. These topics can, however, be gateways to a much seedier underbelly of anti-Semitic conspiracies, which is where we find Mr. Schaefer and many others throughout the world. Former vocalist who was fired two weeks before Christmas in 07, Tim Ripper Owens, said he would never rejoin Iced Earth again. Now, that doesn't make John a fascist, but goddamn, what an a-hole Schaefer is. In February 2021, vocalist Stu Block and bassist Luke Appleton quit the band, quote, in response to recent events and circumstances, end quote. On the same day, Jake Dreyer also announced his departure, stating that, he would be focusing on his band Witherfall, leaving John and his douchebag drummer as the only members. John has released an album in 2022 as Iced Earth, but it contains no new material from the band. It's the bonus disc to a book he released, so it's just an audio soundtrack for a book. I'm assuming the release is to help cover his legal fees. 
He's also releasing two albums after this video is released in April, but again, it's not new music. Schaefer is releasing two EPs of previously released material and live versions of songs. Again, I surmise this is to cover his mounting legal fees and fines. Besides forming Iced Earth, he was also a founding member of the band Demons and Wizards and Sons of Liberty, and acting more like its conductor than simply a member of Sons of Liberty, but we'll talk about them in a second. Demons and Wizards was a collaboration with Blind Guardian frontman Hansi Kursch. Hansi quickly distanced himself from the band and stated their collaboration was over, but I suspect it was a PR move for his own career with any future bands. Hansi is on record saying he thinks Schaefer's side of the story deserves to be heard. And while I think he's referring to the U.S. due process system, I think he forgot why Schaefer was there and what he did. You don't fire Mesa cops on accident. More so, Hansi has mentioned that he and John first began their relationship as, quote, spiritual brothers, and not as people wanting to play music together. So one could theoretically say that Hansi supports what he did, even after growing up in Germany. Sons of Liberty started out as an entirely self-funded side project for John to directly express his right-wing views through music, but turned into a sort of Devin Townsend project, but way less talented and driven, and put together by a musical dictator. I actually feel kind of bad comparing the two. I'm sorry to Devin Townsend and any other fans of his. Anyways, Sons of Liberty is expressly driven by right-wing narratives and books John has read over the years, and his desire to control everything in his life because otherwise he feels weak like his freedoms are being stripped. This includes the lyrics he chooses for this project, not just the song titles and thematics of the album. A big influence, often cited, is the book for the song of the same title, The Creature from Jekyll Island, a book about the evils of the Federal Reserve which has been proven to be demonstrably false. This is relevant to our discussion because G. Edward Griffin is a classic example of a person who writes books that people, i.e. libertarians, can read and fall into the anti-government rabbit hole that leads them to unknowingly citing anti-Semitic conspiracies. I say this because at the heart of most conspiracy theories comes down to Zionism and people complaining about, quote, globalists and the, quote, Jews controlling everything narratives. Unsurprisingly, John fell down this rabbit hole and became another election result denying Trump syncopin. John's perspective on conspiracies seems to be purely about politics. He did openly say in an interview with Westward that he supports David Icke, but it's more about the philosophical implications of what evil governments are doing than about hollow earth or chemtrails or things John believes like the deep state. At one point, John compares Obama to Hitler, Stalin, and Bush Jr. all in one video with pictures for Sons of Liberty. He uses very specific artwork to convey his ideas. Somehow, though, because Donald Trump was so, quote, anti-establishment, John fell into the demagogue hole of Trump, which evolved into sedition and felonious charges. Chapter 3. The Downfall John Schaefer openly admits to first becoming politically woke with Obama in the mid-2010s when he held his first term. I'm no big fan of Obama either, but you don't see me espousing rhetoric about George Soros and globalists and Zionism, which are dog whistles for anti-Semitism. Now, I'm not saying John is an anti-Semite. Oh, wait. No, yes, I am. John is an anti-Semite, whether knowingly or not. He claimed to be as close to an anarchist as you can get, while implying that he's not. So where does that leave him? Hardline libertarian? If so, that still makes him a fascist. Schaefer was as staunch of a Bush Jr. fan as it got, but now vehemently observes him and Obama as two wings on the same small bird, while somehow thinking Trump is some giant eagle. <laughs> At one point, he pushed back against valid criticism of Bush by saying that's, quote, bullshit fucking socialist language, unquote. He also threatened to get up and leave an interview because the person suggested Bush was an imperialist, which he is. During an interview, the previous one with Westward, he talks about believing in what David Icke says. I really don't know how this admission to the outright insane beliefs of David Icke wasn't an enormous red flag for everyone he knew. Also, if not for money, why is his wife still with him? Does she believe in this stuff too? That makes me hope they don't have kids. Unfortunately, he has an 18-year-old daughter. That's quite awful for her. But I digress. Back to John on well-known conspiracy theorist David Icke. Quote, Well, the freaky thing is, there's some stuff, I don't know what it is, there's some similarities. But I came up with this back in 97, and I had never heard of David Icke. I think the Something Wicked story hit me all at once like a ton of bricks. The trilogy came out in 1998 on the album Something Wicked This Way Comes. 
you know, I never learned a lot about the things really going on. I'm not sure I could go all the way with David Icke. I don't have any proof. I agree with much of what he says, but there's a certain point where I say, that's interesting, but I can't prove it. The things I can prove are how criminal and corrupt our government is. That's easy. And all the governments around the world. I think they're working together to lull the population into a nightmarish existence, and I'm not fucking putting up with it. I know a lot of people that aren't. When it comes to that kind of stuff, I agree with David Icke completely. But I have to say this. I think there's far more going on, probably, than meets the eye. But you have to pick your battles. To me, it's far easier to convince free human beings that there's something really wrong when you talk about the blatant and obvious level of corruption we're all dealing with. End quote. Okay, John, so which is it? Do you believe him or not? What are the same ideas you had back in 97? Did you always know we were being controlled by telepathic lizard people and interdimensional Sasquatch? Or do you just hate the deep states and the people running it? Who exactly is they, John? During a 2011 in-studio interview with alt-right conspiracy theorists January 6th instigator and Sandy Hook denier Alex Jones to discuss their mutual political views, Schaefer revealed that, quote, My father was a John Birch guy. When I was a young child, I remember things he and his friends would talk about concerning the UN and stuff, end quote. The John Birch Society is, according to Wikipedia, American right-wing political advocacy group founded in 1958, It is anti-communist, supports social conservatism, and is associated with ultra-conservative, radical right, far right, or libertarian ideas. That should have been a red flag for everyone in his life. Though, now I'm left postulating whether or not the elder Schaefer named his child after his secret society. It was also during this interview John mentioned to Jones that he went to Central America and became, quote, disconnected. He was quoted in Westward about the trip, saying, quote, It wasn't necessarily that I saw something. It's that disconnected. I kind of unplugged and took a vacation for the first time in my life and got out of the system and away from the cell phones and the fucking television and all the shit we're bombarded with. After a few weeks, I really started to feel different, and I really started to reconnect with what it is I'm supposed to be instead of being trapped in the hamster wheel. It was a big thing. End quote. It sounds to me like he inadvertently admitted he liked being in socialist left-wing bullshit countries, and really enjoyed his U.S. dollar and white privilege to its unironic fullest. Is it safe to surmise that John has never read any leftist theory or even had a basic understanding how things like hospitals, unions, and roads come from communist or socialist ideals? Does he even have any concept of what a banana republic is or why it's called that? Because he was right in the thick of it. What do you think? I do want to sit with this idea for a second. Not only the irony, but... Because of the cognitive dissonance it takes to have your, quote, eyes opened by an area of the world like that and come back to the United States and still say we live in the greatest and most free country in the world. The fucking hubris of this guy. No wonder he fell for such a giant grift in the J6 failed insurrection. Now, look at yourself, John, you fucking clown. As mentioned before, the majority of Schaefer's conspiracy beliefs stem from severe distrust in the government. And this is where his COVID-19 denial and belief it's a hoax came into play for contemporary conspiracies. And where his distrust for the U.S. for truths like 9-11, the Federal Reserve, Alex Jones documentaries, crisis actors, false flags, and so on. This formed his early machinations for virulence towards Democrats, and now both sides left and right, and the federal government as a whole. John Schaefer was the first person arrested to reach a plea deal with the government. I want to repeat that. He was the first person arrested to reach a plea deal with the government. John turned himself in and has also landed on witness protection because he's most likely an informant. I would also bet when he was incarcerated, he was in protective custody. And if sentenced to prison, will be in protective custody again for, quote, his own safety. Schaefer waived his preliminary hearing as well as his rights to an identity hearing and production of a warrant in late January in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Indiana. John is facing not only federal charges, but is also being sued in a civil suit by the District of Columbia Attorney General Carl Racine for his role in January 6. On December 14, 2021, the lawsuit was filed in federal court in Washington, D.C., accusing 31 members of Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys, including Schaefer, of, quote, conspiring to terrorize the district, end quote, on January 6, 2021. We know this because there were 25 attempts across three states from three different addresses to serve him for the civil lawsuit. 
Requests to serve him by alternative means, including email and press publication, were denied by a judge. The most recent report I could find indicated he had not been located. However, the blabbermouth.net article I've linked in the description uses only past tense verbs, so it's likely that one could surmise John has since obtained the summons. Schaefer is one of only two that have eluded receiving their summons. One of the terms of his release is that he's required to notify the probation office of any travel outside the state of Indiana, so we can only hope that in the future, during his trial, this will be used against him. The last two known updates I read on him are from October 22 and January 23. The one from October was an update about how he was evading the process servers we talked about earlier, and the January update is a status report from his attorney, Andrew C. Marcantel of Attorneys for Freedom Law Firm, about how he's cooperating with authorities from the federal government. Schaefer was criminally charged and indicted for his role in perpetuating the January 6th attack. In connection with a promise to cooperate with investigators and potentially testify in criminal cases related to the conspiracy to commit the January 6th attack, Schaefer pleaded guilty to the entire statement of offense in the criminal action brought against him, which included two felony offenses. One, trespass of the Capitol while armed with a deadly or dangerous weapon. And two, obstruction of an official proceeding of Congress. Although Schaefer was initially charged with six crimes, including engaging in an act of physical violence and targeting police with the chemical bear spray, he pleaded guilty to only two charges, obstruction of an official proceeding of Congress and trespassing on restricted grounds of the Capitol while armed with a deadly or dangerous weapon. The first charge is punishable by up to 20 years in prison, while the second carries up to a 10-year prison term. The totality of his folly at this point in time looks to be having to reform two large and well-known metal bands being dropped by two hugely influential heavy metal record labels, Century Media and SPV, being incarcerated at both Washington, D.C. and Indiana jails, the looming trial where he could logically be in prison for at least three or four years per his plea deal, and hopefully, like, in Marion County, he'll keep receiving death threats and be assaulted by urine and feces, and the fiscal responsibility for all this. I fully suspect Schaefer of having ratted out the other Oath Keepers and possibly Prow Boys or others in exchange for bail out of Indiana jail and reduced prison sentence. Though he did run from the authorities and tried to evade being served over 25 times, so only time will tell. I keep mentioning his plea deal, also called plea bargain or negotiated plea, so before we get out of here, let's go over that real quick. A basic plea bargain is an agreement between a defendant and a prosecutor in which the defendant agrees to plead guilty or, quote, no contest in exchange for an agreement by the prosecutor to drop one or more charges, reduce the charge to a less serious offense, or recommend to the judge a specific sentence acceptable to the defense. In this case, John's deal involves an estimated three to four years in prison, as well as being on witness protection when he's released. More than 90% of convictions come from negotiated pleas, which means less than 10% of criminal cases end up in trial, so this is not really surprising. What is worth noting, however, is how he'll be in witness protection, and it seems while incarcerated he will be under protective custody, or PC. What this means is that while in prison, John is not allowed to interact with the general population, or gen pop. This is most often done for people with particularly disgusting cases like rape or pedophilia, so the rest of the prison doesn't literally murder them. This is also often done with informants, or what's commonly known as snitches. This is the big reason for my thinking he's been ratting out other Oath Keepers and possibly Proud Boys and or Three Percenters. There's no logical reason to keep him sequestered and on witness protection if all he did was storm the Capitol unless he became an informant. A couple of other notes about John's plea and his cooperation with verbal admittance of what happened, he admits... After arriving on Capitol grounds, he walked past barriers intended to restrict access to the public and to a set of locked doors on the Capitol's west side. And he admits to being among the first individuals to push past the damaged doors and into the Capitol building, forcing the officers to retreat. Schaefer and others advanced towards five or six backpedaling USCP officers, while members of the mob swelled inside of the Capitol and overwhelmed the officers. Whether he gets what's coming to him judicially will be seen, but one can only hope. Chapter 4, Outro Before the conclusion, I wanted to clear up why I made this video. I have two reasons. One, to inform and educate anyone interested in this subject. It's an unfolding case, and it's nice to have all the information preserved nicely in one space you can easily access. And two, to endlessly make fun of this nearly 60-year-old (laughs) man-child. Now that that's all cleared up, 
even though I did as much thorough research for this as I could, I know there's more information to be gleaned in the future. For instance, he has another update due out the end of March, and as more things come out, I would like to do an update video. But until then, I guess the only way to end this video is to say, fuck John Schaefer and fuck every other fascist that ever lived. Addendum. On March 10th, John Schaefer's attorney asked to join a series of motions to dismiss the lawsuit and some responses from other defendants, stating that the arguments made in those filings similarly apply to Schaefer. Those motions argue that the District of Columbia does not have standing to bring civil action against the defendants because the civil rights statutes cited in the district's lawsuit limit standing to injured federal officials or officers, not a governmental entity. As of Friday afternoon, U.S. District Judge Amit P. Mehta, who is presiding over the case, had not ruled on the merits of Schaefer's request or the motions to dismiss the lawsuit.